So now's the time that we're transferring the plans, the dimensions on our floor plan sheet, which is one of the sheets in a set of plans, floor plan. It's the drawing as if you're looking down on the footprint of the house, onto the footprint of the house. The dimensions are given in feet and inches, gotta love that. And so the challenge is to make sure that you are working square to the perimeter so that your dimensions are not brought in at an angle and thus not accurate at the 90 degree orientation. The challenge is to make sure that you always mark the right side of the line so you don't put a dimension down and then put the wall on the wrong side of that mark. So for that reason, I'm marking both sides of all the walls. I'm snapping it in red chalk because I don't care if it's indelible. In fact, I'm counting on it being indelible. I never want it to come off. And if it rains, I want it to still be discernible. So red chalk's a good choice for that. And I'm making sure that the lines are nice and bright because there's nothing worse than trying to plate this or stand the walls and you have to look around and just can't find the line. So these lines need to be apparent. I'm using both a uh, pencil for the finer marking, you know, within a sixteenth of an inch. An eighth is okay, but a sixteenth is better. And I have Kiel lumber crayon on the other side so that I can put sort of big general instructions and mark in a way that I can find it as I'm walking by. I think I'm going to switch from yellow to red. Red's a lot easier to see than the yellow. I, yellow on <laughs> yellow OSB is not that effective, but Anyway, it's nice to be able to mark a big bold mark and a fine mark when you're doing this layout. And it's also a good idea to have somebody working with you. I mean, so hold me, holding the end of the tape, making sure that's inches. right so you're not walking back and forth. Holding the end of the chalk line so you don't have to drive a nail and hook and pull. This is one of those instances where another person on the job is, frankly, you know, not indispensable, but certainly useful. Twice to you. So everybody's got their own system for laying out and we're going to be putting a lot more information in little symbols and marks on the plates here in a few minutes. But for now, the only symbols we're really using are crow's feet to mark an exact dimension, chalk lines to mark the side of the plate, and an X to mark which side of the line, which side of the mark is the active side, which side of the mark is the place that the wall goes. So in this first step, develop your own system. I mean, you're probably the person that's going to have to work with it. But if you're part of a bigger outfit to where someone else is going to come back in and plate the layout that you put down, there's a fairly standard method that may be sort of well known where you're at, or at least it needs to be well known by the person that's coming behind you. I know that in the American Southwest, where piecework is a part of um, residential framing process, there is an agreement just to snap out a building, just to snap these lines. A layout guy will snap it out and then someone else will come in and plate it, and then the layout guy comes back and details the plates. And he is very consistent. His marks are the same all the time, and it doesn't matter who the wall framing crew is when they come in, they're gonna recognize his, there's kind of a legend. There's sort of a, a, a code that is well known in the American Southwest as to how these things are laid out. I'm not sure I remember it exactly, but at least part of what I do here today is gonna have elements of the way that I played when I lived in Vegas. The takeaway is this, since I'm the guy that's going to be plating and detailing and framing these walls, I'm the only guy that has to be able to read my hieroglyphics. Well, Daniel and Lenny and I have to be able to read the hieroglyphics. And the same may well be true with you. If you're going to lay it out and you're going to build it, then just make sure that you remember what your marks mean two or three days later when you come back and have to commit yourself to actually driving some nails. After everything on the first floor is snapped out, that is the lines are popped onto the deck where the walls have to be, we're going to move to the next step of framing, which is referred to as plating, or more commonly, plating and detailing. Before we really get into this, let me give you a few ideas about what to expect here about the next phase of this project. First of all, try not to worry or feel left behind if everything I'm doing and explaining isn't making perfect sense. If you feel like I'm not going into enough detail or didn't mention something that appears to be important, 
because there are a lot of steps in building a house. Even just a single family residential unit like this, there are multiple processes happening at the same time, and it is impossible to fully explore every one of them the first time it comes along. Just take my word for it that by the time this framing job is done, everything should make, make sense, or at least everything hopefully will have been described. Think of it like a movie where you might see a character do something early on in the film that you can't fully understand until later on in the movie, and it becomes clear. It snaps into focus, and maybe you'll even understand why it would have been pointless for that character to be more fully developed when the movie started. Another thing to think about is the point of this video series is not to turn you into a framer or a contractor or a carpenter, but to give you a look at the entire big picture of how a house comes together. All the different processes, the people, the sequences, the materials, the scheduling, the pitfalls, the mistakes, and the general guidelines. As far as framing goes, usually a new carpenter or laborer has to be on several house builds before things even begin to sort of, you know, clarify, crystallize into something to where he can anticipate what is going to happen next and why that project that was just finished had to be done at that time in that way. It takes a while. At least it did for me. I don't think I really had a handle on framing until I had helped and been a part of maybe a dozen different custom home jobs early in my career. And even that, it wasn't until I had been piecework framing for maybe six months that framing really sort of, I had it. I felt fluent. I felt capable with the whole system because I understood the why and the outcomes. Now, in today's world, the Internet makes a lot of this information available much easier, much faster, and on anybody's schedule. So I'm not saying that you have to build a certain number of houses before you understand things. I'm just making the point that I'm going to try to teach you everything I possibly can about how I frame houses. But it's going to get spread over dozens of videos, so hang in there and try to be patient. When I was really, really young in my career, in fact, I think it was the first house build I ever stepped foot on, I made a really dumb mistake. Well, actually, over the last 40 years, I've made lots of really dumb mistakes, but the one I remember in particular, and that this video has reminded me of, happened because I didn't understand the big picture and the sequence of events. Stay tuned at the end of this episode, and I'll tell you what happened. Virtually all the lumber we're using to build this house is Douglas fir. Douglas fir is pretty much the best there is for framing and for several reasons. It is strong in every direction, parallel to grain, perpendicular to grain. In a span situation, it doesn't deflect much. It's got a lot of strength there. It's not too heavy. It resists rot to an extent. It's relatively stable and it's affordable. But the fact that Douglas fir grows readily in the Northwest and is processed at a lot of locations here and has been for generations, combined with its characteristics, structural characteristics, make it an all around top tier building material in Southern Oregon. And the engineering community generally agrees with me on this, although Southern Yellow Pine is a close second and in some specific characteristics, in fact, is better than Douglas fir. Now, pine, cedar, spruce, redwood, hemlock, they each have things and applications and characteristics where they excel. But all around, Douglas fir can't be beat. The only thing that beats a good quality second growth Douglas fir board is a tight grain old growth Douglas fir board, which still shows up in these stacks from time to time. The lumber I bought for this house has been kiln dried. KD is a designation in the ordering process and often stamped on the boards. This is an extra step in the manufacturing process where the lumber is dried in a kiln, which raises the temperature pretty high, like high, so that as the water is rushed because it's in a hurry to get to the surface and evaporate because it's inside the wood and it's 
probably nearly turning to steam, it actually ruptures the wood, the cells of the wood, as I understand it. And once those cells are ruptured, not only does the water escape more easily, but it doesn't absorb water from high humidity as quickly, and it is much, much more stable. The upshot of this is, is that it reduces warping. It's also lighter. Now, once a house is framed, it's a lot harder for lumber to warp in some situations because it's sort of restrained, right? It's held in place, but it is possible, and it will warp, especially studs and, and members that are freestanding in a wall. The real reason to pay extra for kiln-dried, and I don't know, maybe it's 80 bucks, a 1000 more or something like that. I'll check and let you know for sure. But the real reason is to make your life easier when framing. Sometimes lumber will sit on a job site for a few days or even weeks before it's put to use. And if that lumber warps even a little bit while it's in the stack, it can create some real headaches in getting things put together properly. Now, if I had a full crew here working and the lumber was being cut and installed within a day or two, I probably wouldn't feel as urgent about spending the extra money on the kiln dried. On this job, though, it was an inexpensive sort of little insurance policy because Daniel and I just can't get that much work done while the cameras are rolling. And so since we know this project is going to go slowly and the lumber will have to sit, kiln dried is going to end up being less expensive than green would have been. Now, as a general point relative to keeping your lumber straight, try to keep it out of the direct sun. Stack it as neatly as possible. Lumber, especially softwoods, are photoreactive. That is, as they dry out and as they are exposed to sunlight, they crawl, they travel. And so if you keep it under a rafter or under a roof or even under a couple sheets of plywood, your lumber is going to stay a lot straighter over time. Part of framing that I would like to cover right now is about takeoffs. A takeoff refers to calculating and ordering the material for your job off of the blueprints. When you're building a house, you order lumber and it is delivered in truckloads. It's delivered to the job by your supplier, ordinarily or usually it can be. Now you might have a nice pickup and a nice trailer, but let me tell you what. When you're talking about units of lumber and stacks of lumber and big heavy loads of lumber like it takes to build a whole house, any delivery fee that might apply is worth every penny. Now I did the takeoffs for this job months ago. I sat down in my office with the plans and a notebook and I counted and I calculated and I scaled and I, I, I went through the whole process calculating every piece of lumber and a certain percentage for waste, you know, depending on the process and the lumber anywhere from, you know, 8% to 15% for waste. I used all the multipliers that I've learned over the years. For instance, the number of studs in a wall is usually 1.2 times the lineal feet of wall. That is, for every foot of wall, you're going to use a little over one stud. It's a pretty accurate thing. And there are a few others that we'll talk about. But the idea is, I did this while I was waiting for the permit. It took a few days of very focused office work. I can enjoy... The fact that I don't have to go through all of this again now that it's time to get this show on the road.
Ordering and receiving the materials is sort of a delicate dance, right? It's, it's, you don't want to order it all at once because then you have to, it'll, you know, you're buried. You can't move around and it'll degrade over time or it could be stolen or it gets dirty or the stack's tipped over or whatever. I mean, it does not stay pristine for very long when it's sitting on the job site. You want to order it soon enough in advance that you always have what you need on hand and never have to stop work because you ran out of lumber, but you don't want to have to trip on the stuff and you don't want to have to call the police department and report a big lumber theft over a long weekend. So I've ordered and had delivered all, the, all of the lumber for the first floor of our house. The exterior walls will be built from 2 by 6s in order to facilitate the specified R value of insulation in the walls. And the interior partitions are framed by 2 by 4s The first part of the wall that you're going to learn about are the plates, top and bottom plates. These are two identical boards that make up the top and bottom of a wall. They start together, cut exactly to the same length, marked in exactly the same way. The marks have to be exactly the same on each board, otherwise the studs and the trimmers and the headers and the cripples and all of the parts of the wall that go, that go in that wall will not be plumb. They won't be vertical, they won't be even if your marking is sloppy. So you pay attention when you're detailing these things. The detailing happens simultaneously so that when you separate them and start building the wall, there's no problem with the alignment of the pieces that you've nailed in place. We've assembled this exterior wall here, and this is a pretty good place to show you the basic components of a wall. I want to run through these terms so you are sort of familiar with them when we go through the rest of the detailing. This wall has a top plate and a bottom plate. This is a window and a door opening. These are bottom cripples, there are top cripples, trimmers, king studs, headers, bottom sills. Right away you can see the general approach of assembling these frameworks. These walls are put together on the deck and it's entirely two-dimensional. And then they will all be raised at once or at least in sequence, in whatever sequence makes the most sense. And what was two-dimensional suddenly becomes three-dimensional. It's pretty neat. The deck we put down becomes really a giant template or a workbench and it becomes an important part of the process of building the walls. You have to keep it clean and clear and plan which walls to plate and detail and frame first and where you're going to have room to frame the other walls once the wall you're working on is put in place. We're starting with the east and west exterior walls, the two longest of the downstairs. I mentioned this in the last episode, but I have Daniel here cutting out and assembling the different components 
that we'll be using for framing the walls in this first floor. All the walls on this level are the same height. That is, the studs, the common studs, the typical studs, will all be the same length. And I calculated the quantity of these items at the same time I did the takeoffs. He has a pretty good list to work through. How many channels, how many corners, how many headers, the top cripples, the bottom cripples, all of it. Now you can't always pre-cut everything like this, but any time you can, it's a time saver. And if you cut them on a saw, some sort of a, you know, a saw with a sliding or a chopping mechanical capability, I don't care how good you are with a skill saw, the machine is going to make a tighter, smoother cut that will fit together more accurately and with less variation against the top plate, against the bottom plate, and just make a, a nice clean assembly. When we were editing the draft of this video and I was watching that deck and snapping the lines and plating, you know, dropping those pairs of two by fours and two by sixes and cutting them and placing them and nailing them together. I remembered a, <laughs> I remembered a mistake I made on the first house I ever worked on the first residential wood framed house that I was ever paid to work on was probably in 1979, maybe. Uh, 78, 79, right in there. No, I don't know when it was, but I wasn't married yet, and I went to work for Gary Wagner right here in Roseburg. Coincidentally, and you might be interested to know that Steve Hood was working for Gary Wagner. You've seen Steve helping me on this project and others. I, I count Steve a very good friend and one of very few men I've ever worked with that I couldn't quite keep up with framing, even when I was young. So anyway, we went to school together, and so I'm on this job for Gary Wagner, and we decked this, this uh, it was a daylight basement. And I got there just at the time that they had rolled the joists for the, for the main floor over the daylight basement, and they had it decked, and I got there about the next day. So Steve was carpenter, and he had, I don't know, two or three years' experience, but the lead man's name was Art. And Art was about 6'3", probably weighed 190, real lean, real raw-boned, real pointy features, real smart, real assertive, and a short, short fuse with a, just an extreme temper. And I picked up right off the bat that Art was somebody you kind of kept an eye on because he was, he was wild. And he was a go-ahead guy. And as an example of the effort that is wasted in construction by not thoroughly training the new guy when he gets there and, and telling him exactly what his job is and what, where he fits into the scheme of things, Art was snapping out the wall lines on this deck about the same size as the house that you just watched be snapped and plated. And he said, start packing those 16-foot 2x4s over there and laying them in pairs around where the chalk lines are. Uh, okay. Now, I didn't know anything. I had been logging for, you know, summers for the uh, last couple of years of high school and for my dad. I had helped dad on remodel projects. I had built tree houses and boats. and But I didn't know anything. And so, all right, so I started running back and forth from the pile to the deck and carrying the two-by-fours, you know, four and six and eight at a time and really trying to get something done because it was great to work and I wanted to be productive and I had decided I was going to be a carpenter. And then all of a sudden, I had the plates all scattered and the unit was about half gone and I didn't know what to do next. And I was antsy. I had a belly full of acid because I, I wanted to be productive and I hated to ask and Art hated to be asked what I should do next. So I glanced over and I saw that he was detailing these plates and they were in a pair and he nailed a couple of them together right inside of where the wall line was and I thought, aha, these boards are to be nailed down inside these chalk lines. So while Art was detailing over on that end, I was busily nailing down these plates in pairs, nail down the bottom plate, put the next plate on it and nail it to it. And I got about a third of the way around the perimeter of the floor when Art looked over and saw what I was doing and let out kind of a bellow and as I remember, he threw his hammer, and the morale on the job just went right through the floor, right? So anyhow, I kind of feel a little bad for new guys when they are there to work, and they want to work, and they're used to working, 
and they're wanting to learn something new and nobody takes time to tell them. And so when you have some kid like that, here's the takeaway. Get the good out of him by explaining to him what his job ought to be. And when he makes the mistake of nailing down the plates when you're not ready and you've got to put him to work prying them apart and backing the nails out, just keep telling yourself he'll be a go-getter and really productive when he finally knows what's happening next. The second reason that I wanted to tell you this little story is so you could get a look at this little podcast studio. That's what this is. This is where Nate and I have been uh, recording, filming, and from where we upload the podcasts that we have now on pretty much every podcast platform that you may be using. Just look up Essential, Essential Craftsman as a podcast and you will find a fair number and a growing number of podcasts where we talk about frequently asked questions on the Spec House project. We take deep dives into material selection and, and uh, alternative building practices. We talk about and interview the subcontractors that we're using, including Phil the Plumber. And we just will expand this podcast thing into an opportunity to add more detail to the things that you watched on the videos that there just wasn't time to squeeze into the actual narration on the site. So there's going to be a ton of information coming through the podcast. You already know that there's sort of an avalanche of information sort of coming through the videos. And between these two sources, hopefully, you get your questions answered. And at the end of the day, have a much, much better understanding of how a house is built in the western United States and the other things that we do around here to while away the hours. <laughs>